So I just gave you a formula for torsion. That's what this tau is called in this case. So we're going to find, so let's take an easy curve. We'll do the three sine t, three cos t, four t. And I want to know Tn torsion and B. We are going to find a uh, The order I've written in the notes is this order. I think we want to find, you always find T first, and you can get N. Look in your notes. I can't answer that question every day. Uh, and it probably needs to be on your cheat sheet at this point. You shouldn't be flipping through your notes. You should be looking at your cheat sheet and figuring it out in two or three seconds. These are not questions you should be pondering. Like the speed of knowledge accumulation is faster than our learning speed. That's a question you can ponder. Uh, what is TNB and tau? Those are not things to ponder. Those are well defined. All right, so go ahead, compute these. I think I have them in the right order. The way I've defined torsion, I think you have to get, yeah, you need to find, no, I think you can find torsion separately as long as you have, if you use this definition for torsion, you can actually find it pretty quick. All you really need is the velocity and acceleration. Remember this, uh, these come out of the uh, non-normalized velocity and acceleration here. So, uh, and jerk, is that right? Velocity, yeah. acceleration, jerk. Yeah, they're not the normalized versions. So make sure uh, you pay attention to that. So you can find torsion separately. So you can copy down what I'm writing, but you should be computing these yourself, which is why I'm writing and not talking. skipping some steps. Let me know if I make a mistake. I'll, I'll take a minute break, let you guys catch up. Any other questions?
So are you talking about the fifth on the last line or the second to the last line or the third to the last line? Oh, sorry. So the uh, two prime, you one Yeah, so that, I have T on the next line above. So all I did was took a derivative. That's a constant multiple, so it's a constant multiple rule. No, yeah, yeah. So I got that part. The, the, the part that I'm confused about is that you take the magnitude direct to subtract the two prime. Is what you're uh, the next line down, yeah. So I found the, the derivative T two prime. Then I needed the magnitude of it because B is basically T over magnitude of, or T prime over magnitude T prime. But so I guess my question is, wouldn't that be? Which is one fifth. Oh, okay. So I just brought my scalar outside the magnitude, right there. Because you knew that it was going to do so. Because I know. Uh, I'm using a lot of properties at once. And in this case, it's one fifth. Basically, just brought the fifth down. So it just got brought. I, I'm skipping a step for sure. Okay, and then you only because this three. is like one of 18 things I'm going to compute. Is why I'm skipping steps. Okay. So you probably want to show about 30 to 100 percent more steps than I'm showing. <laughs> Somewhere in that range. Oh yeah, absolutely. Jeez. Yeah, B is the cross them too. So that's N, N. And the order's important. Is B N cross B is T cross N. Right, not N cross T. Okay. Now what I had to do for my first row and my cross product, I had to distribute my one fifth through because I needed the x, y, z components of that, not the a scalar multiple by the times that. So I had to distribute my one fifth. I can. I don't know what's going to happen. I can put a work order in and cross my fingers.
are there any T, N, or B questions? <coughs> I kind of saw what you were doing, so you kind of took a shortcut, and instead of writing them out, you kind of moved, like block the one letter that you didn't need in the I or the J or the K, and then just do the cross multiplication. Yeah, so what I generally recommend is you take a pen or pencil. Oh, that's really too thin of a highlighter. Uh, you take a pen or pencil or your finger and cover up the row or the column that you don't want to use. And then you can just do the cross multiplication right there. Yeah, if you know what you're doing. It's AB, a, AD minus BC. Yeah, yeah. Yep, so I skipped the two by two determinants. I think that's an awesome So one thing you want to be careful about when you skip steps, it requires more of your short-term memory because you're relying on your brain more than what you're looking at on your paper. So it's basically reducing your short-term memory, but it increases your speed. So it's a trade-off. You have to use occupy more of your memory if you skip more steps. You also generally increase the rate of mistakes because you're relying on your memory. Did you find torsion? I have not even started finding torsion yet, okay, that? but that's the next step. <laughs> okay. So we got the every, we've computed I think almost all these before. So we're about to find the torsion. I'm going to compute it. You could compute the torsion right here, but the problem is I have a ds derivative, and that's going to be kind of a pain, not just a regular t derivative. So it's not just the derivative of v. Uh, so because of that, I'm going to use the version on the right here. Uh, the first row is basically the components of V, which is R prime, and then I'm going to need to compute uh, acceleration, which is R double prime, and then jerk, which is R triple prime. So I'm going to do all that on the left instead of over on the right side. The reason I rewrote R prime is because I'm going to put them into a matrix and find the determinant. And they'll basically be in the exact same. I got R prime up top. I'll have R double prime and R triple prime down below. So they'll already be laid out like they will in the matrix. What I don't want to do is look all over my page and then try to collect them together. dot notation there so you can see exactly um, where x dot y dot z dot come from and the double dots and the triple dots. a parenthesized exponent, well, that would be the third derivative. Okay. So it's kind of like your, basically the primes are essentially the dots. I mean, it's just a different way to write prime. Um, but yeah, after about three or four, it gets silly writing dots of primes.
what row or column would be the best to expand across? Uh, row one is not the best. Column three. Why is column three column, column the best? So I maximize the number of zeros in my expansion row or column. So you can use column one or, or row one, but I'm going to go ahead and use column three. Now I want to make sure that my signs are correct. Because whenever you're not going across row one or column one, make sure you're starting with the correct sign. So in this case, it's going to go plus minus plus. If I was in a four by four matrix on the last column, I'd go minus plus minus plus. So make sure you pay attention to that. So we get four times the determinant of this matrix that I just boxed. And the reason I did that, so I can add the minus zero times whatever the other determinant is, plus zero times the other determinant. I don't care about the other two determinants because they're going to be zeroed out. Questions on the tau, the torsion computation? Or any leftover questions off TNB? Um, I have a question. So, how is it that you're multiplying the that row and the, the two columns, or the column times the two rows? Because you said four times those two. So it's four. So we're going to expand on the third uh, column. Mm -hmm. So the first. So in the third column, first row, I'm crossing out third column, first row. So everything I have unboxed, the lower left two by two minor, that's the determinant that I'm multiplying by four. Oh, because all their two just equals zero. It well, not yet. I mean, they do, but here is my submatrix that I'm finding first. So it's the determinant of that matrix times four. Now when I move down to the zero, uh, I'm on the zero now, so I'm ignoring this row. So the submatrix is really those two rows right there. Multiplying by zero, so everything equals zero. Which is why you didn't see it show up right there. That's where that determinant would go. Okay. And then my last one, my last zero, I'd expand there, and now the matrix, uh, the determinant that would go right there would be that two by two. So if you would have chosen the middle uh, column, then you would have had to multiply by the uh, external um, numbers. Yeah, so if I chose the middle, depending on what row, I, you know, if I was like middle, middle, my two by two is like kind of hiding in the corners. Okay. Right there. So you're always covering the row and column that you're looking at. But yeah. you're multiplying by the middle or by the, like by the yeah, middle number. This, I'd be multiplying <coughs> this cos t by the determinant of the, let's call it the corner submatrix. Okay. And I think this is all either in your linear algebra book, or if you don't have that, it's all in pre-calculus book chapter 11, I think is all linear algebra. So it determinates one section in chapter 11, which is why I have your 
old pre-calculus book on, uh, in the file list for this class. Because sometimes you might need to go back and review some determinants or anything else from back, back in the good old days. So now we're going to shift into polar coordinates. We're not going to do such an in-depth in analysis. We're going to only look at velocity and acceleration. So those are the two, in some sense, easiest to compute. You just take the derivative of your position that gives you uh, velocity and derivative of velocity's acceleration. So we're just going to look at those properties and not worry about all the other uh, normalized versions and torsion and all that good stuff. Will that be in calculus four? I don't know. I don't. Th I think calculus four is a lot more general and looks at um, a lot more general situations. Um, you could, I mean, you can always just look up the formulas, the polar formulas for the other pieces if you need them, uh, but we don't go into them. Uh, these were basically confusing enough in rectangular coordinates, yep. in my opinion. Uh, occasionally, you may have to go into polar coordinates and, and find torsion, but we're not going to. So I'm going to draw a curve that looks pretty similar to the curve that we started with. I'm also going to put an xy axis here. So I'll just draw some curve right there. Let's think about a point on the curve right there. Now before, this point had coordinates xy or xyz. But in polar coordinates, we're gonna, we haven't talked about spherical coordinates yet or cylindrical coordinates, so we're going to keep it two-dimensional. So we're not going to go into three dimensions. In this class, will we? Uh, I don't know. It's been a, a year since I taught this last. I don't know exactly where spherical coordinates come in, but it's soon. I don't know if it's this quarter or next quarter. Okay. You can read the textbook and... <laughs> see what sections we do. Okay, so let's think about if I just took a derivative of r and a derivative of theta, so that would be just taking a derivative here. The, well, first of all, these are both supposed to be functions of t, so we're still on a parameterized curve. So these are functions of t. Now you want to be careful, r of t has the exact same name as r of t had five minutes ago, but it means something completely different. Mm. So this R of t is the radius function, or the radial function. It tells you how far away from the origin you are. So when we measure the line I drew, the length of the line is R of t. <coughs> so when I write R of t, what I mean is the magnitude or the length of that line is R of t. That's not the position that we're, uh, the point is in. This is those R, R of t. That's an R of t. Now our theta of t tells us basically our direction. So theta picks what direction your point is relative to the origin, and then R of t tells you the distance to go in that direction. So when we think about derivatives, it's going to have a very different effect. So let's think about the which one first? It doesn't matter. Let's think about theta first, the uh, theta prime. Oh, that's not the right prime. Theta prime of t. So we know derivatives mean change in theta. So theta prime is going to be how much uh, theta would change. So what if I told you theta prime is positive? What would that mean about our angle? What way is it rotating? This way. Kind of clockwise? Or for you, 
let's use counterclockwise and clockwise. <laughs> so if I do this positive, we're going counter. Well, I shouldn't even point because if I point, it's the wrong way. So I'm just going to say counterclockwise. That's a regular way that we count positive angles. So let's assume uh, both of these derivatives are positive. Theta prime and r prime are positive. So theta prime is positive. What that means is our next, uh, if we looked into the future, our future theta will be bigger. So what does that mean here for our point? I have no idea. I don't know about our next radial measure, but I do know that, let's see, if you think about where this is going, our next theta is going to be bigger. So that means our point's going to be, I can't really say above what you really want to do, and I can't rotate the projector. Maybe I'll rotate. No, they won't let me rotate the paper either. So you basically have to reorient yourself, and I'll draw some temporary axes here. There's a temporary reorientation. So the axis going this way, that basically tells you how theta is going to be changing. So if theta prime is positive, our next point is going to be up on the blue axis. If theta prime is negative, our next point would be somewhere downwards on the blue axis. Now this is just the uh, angle measure. So next we'll look at the theta measure, or at the uh, radius measure. Would that be just along the other axis? Oh, for sure. Uh, so yeah, our point doesn't have to move along this line. It would move along this line if our r prime was zero. That would mean it's not going any amount away or towards the origin. So we have to think about movement very differently. So r prime measures how much you're going towards the origin or away from the origin. Whereas theta prime basically is your orthogonal to the origin direction. And that's probably the best way to think about polar, uh, a curve in polar coordinates. So the radius tells you how far from the origin you are, and the theta tells you uh, rotationally, but at a point, really, your orthogonal movement. <coughs> sure it does. Oh, it does. Just, okay. it just tells you a different coordinate system. But it, okay. So this basically creates a local frame. The only problem is it's, if I'll draw the old local frame. The old local frame looked like this. <laughs> so it's going to draw a local frame, but it won't be the same one. So the old local frame had a t in the velocity direction and an n pointing towards the direction you were turning. So we have a different uh, local frame this time around. However, you still have a local frame. So there's two directions I'll call using the book, oops, let's go back to blue. So how much we're going in the theta direction, we'll call that u theta. Uh, u is for unit. So this will be a lot like the, I don't really want to say t or n, but it's going to serve a similar purpose. It's going to give us a frame. And this, in this case, we're just going to go with the theta uh, direction. And then the other one is going to be u r, which will go this way. And I'll write out these coordinates. So we'll go UR first. So that's going to be cos theta, comma, sine theta. And U theta is negative sine theta, comma, cosine theta. Yes, and this is uh, this will give us unit arrows. So these will be unit vectors in these two directions. So these magnitudes should be one. You can pretty easily just look if you uh, found the magnitude of either of those, you get one. And if we found enough magnitudes in the last week, that's obvious at this point. So we have a rotation matrix. I'll write that out.
Oh, before I talk about rotation matrix, uh, what variable did not show up in either of these two vectors? T. T didn't show up, but what other variable? Tension. R. No, <laughs> so what that means, it doesn't matter how big R is or how small R is. So if you think about it, would it really, would u theta and u r be any different if I was at that point? No. You would still have the exact same two directions. So that tells you it's independent of how far from the origin you are. So our rotation matrix, m is going to go from two dimensions to two dimensions. And it is the matrix. cos theta, negative sine theta, sine theta, cos theta. You have to have to answer my question. <laughs> so I guess you're saying that <laughs> the path, like you, you, you just said that it does tell you about the path, but like I'm just picturing like you, if we move that, that down that line, the u, u theta and the u r are still going to be the same. Well, when I say they're the same, what I mean is they don't start from the same point, but they are the same vectors. They point the same direction. Yeah. So u r always points away from the origin. So anywhere on that line, away from the origin, is the same direction, right? Yeah. And then u theta is going to point orthogonal to that direction. So either way, it's the same two directions. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just wondering, like, what does then, you're saying that it tells you about the path, what does the path have to do with that? Because it's always going to be the same path. I think I know what he's asking me. So does that local frame change? Do those vectors change as it goes along the path? The direction of those vectors? Oh, yeah, for sure. So. They change whenever your theta changes. So the path I drew has a different theta value at every single point. So if that was in a linear line, then the, the theta would be different in every single point. Or oh, wow. That is a velocity vector I drew. So you got to know where your origin is so you can... So that's our u r and our u theta right there. Okay. Does that? So what if we, if we had a, like a, like, I don't know, not a linear line. Like if we had a parabola, that, that theta would constantly be changing. But generally, your theta, is, your theta is only going to stay the same if you're moving directly away or directly towards the origin. Okay. So generally, theta prime is not going to be zero. <coughs> so I'd have to be traveling not only a straight path, but a straight path directly away or towards the origin. Okay, so we're just going to have problems kind of like that. I, I can give you a problem where you're on a curve that's a straight line through the origin, but that's pretty boring. <laughs> generally, your problems won't be straight line through the origin. Okay. So in general, theta prime will not be constant, or will not be zero. Okay. So is the, the statements in the top right of the screen, you are both the sine theta and the theta equals the sine theta, but are those true all the time? Or yep. Just for this? Okay. All you need to know uh, is what theta you have right there. So basically what that tells you is it only, it doesn't matter about r, uh, if they're functions of theta. And like I said, you sh these two points should illuminate that. Like, it doesn't matter what your radius is. <coughs> <coughs> Does so this, this, these things are tricky, definitely. Especially now we have two <laughs> ways to write a local frame. We have a velocity acceleration related way, and uh, uh, this is not really related to velocity acceleration at all. It's related to the way that we've decided how to break this down with R's and you know polar coordinates. So it has to do with the coordinate system, not the direction that our particle is moving. So 
I'm going to erase the extra ones. So let's find the rotation matrix for pi over 2. So I'll go ahead and do that right now. Should be pretty easy, pretty easy theta value. So this rotation matrix is 0, negative 1, 1, 0. It should rotate pi over 2, which is going to be a counterclockwise rotation. So let's see what happens if we multiply this matrix. So which of these vectors, if I rotate pi over 2 counterclockwise, would equal the other vector? So if I, well, if I, if I rotate ur, <coughs> pi over 2, I should get u theta. So let's check that and make sure that that's true. So let's find m times ur. So this might be the first time you've multiplied a matrix by a vector. So have you multiplied, anybody not multiplied two matrices together? So that's all you're doing here. You're multiplying two matrices together. But you might say, oh, the other one is a vector. Yeah, it's the same thing. They're two matrices. So you go across the first and no. Down. Wait, is that? I'll be in trouble if I go this way, right? Yeah. It won't. It won't make sense. So uh oh. It's been a long time since I've multiplied matrices. Yeah, you go down the first one and cross on the second one. So we have a two by two multiplied by. So we have one row, two columns. Oh, we're in trouble. I yeah. can't multiply these. All right, so it is. So U R times it. What's that? So U R times it. Well, I can certainly multiply them. The other it would make. The product would exist. It may not give me what I want, but we can always try to flip them around and see what we would get. So let's just change the order real quick, and maybe that will give us what I want. So we're going to go across and then down. Oh, I think I know. I, I don't think it's going to give us what we want, but we'll do this anyways. Should we write it down? Yeah. We got cos, so we got zero plus sine theta, and then negative cos plus zero. So sine negative cos. Yeah, it's not what I wanted. 
uh, original matrix was uh, u theta was negative sine positive cos. This was positive sine negative cos. Alright, I think I know what we need to do. So have you seen the transpose operation? Is that a movie? Oh my <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so <laughs> what transposing does, it swaps rows and columns. So it's very easy to transpose a one by anything or, an, or uh, anything by one matrix. So our vector is going to get transposed. So instead of being, well, I'll write it out the regular form. Cos theta sine theta. So when I transpose this, it's going to be cos theta on the top, sine theta on the bottom. And now multiplication should make sense. So we're going to go across the first and down the second. So we got zero cosine minus sine theta. And then cosine theta plus zero sine theta. And then I believe we untranspose this to get, hopefully, u theta would be the transpose of this. So when I transpose it, it's negative sine positive cosine. Should be negative sine, positive cosine, yes. So u theta transpose is m times u r transpose. So I think I'm going to mostly stick to, well, on your final exam of quizzes, I'll keep polar coordinates, velocities, and accelerations off of there. So I think things are tricky enough in rectangular coordinates. So that's the end of chapter 13 right there. So next up, we have functions of separ uh, several variables. So what we're going to do is have inputs that are more than one variable. And we're going to do partial derivatives. That's one of the next. Now, before we do any of that, we'll do a whole bunch of uh, just general function, uh, multivariable function properties, like domains, uh, continuity, things like that, limits, all that fun stuff. So we'll do a bunch of geometry and functions first before we do calculus.